Every one of us here is carrying a supercomputer. It's warm, it's wet, it's squishy, and we've had it ever since we were born. This supercomputer runs off a cheeseburger <laughs> and consumes roughly the same amount of energy as a light bulb. And no, as you're probably thinking, I'm not referring to the smartphone in your pocket. I'm referring to the brain in your head. Brains are an amazing organ. Uh, they allow us to understand the world we live in. We use our brains to control our bodies, to talk with one another, and we're not the only ones with brains. Animals and insects, such as dogs, cats, bees, um, and even the octopus, all have brains that allow them to survive and thrive. The brain is also the only known entity that has what we call general intelligence. It's the kind of intelligence that we have spent trillions of dollars um, getting computers to imitate the brain in the form of AI. But AI is not just expensive to build. There are costs involved with the energy, the water, and the data required to build ever larger systems. So here's an idea. Instead of us trying to make ever larger computers to imitate the brain at at greater costs, what if we went the other way? And what if we could build a computer from a brain? Now, brains are made up of roughly around 89 billion cells. And these brain cells communicate with one another using very tiny electrical signals. And because electricity is the shared common language between the cells and a computer, we can listen in and try to understand the secret language of these cells. At my lab, we have special computer chips where we grow um, brain cells and these chips not only allows us to uh, receive the electrical signals, but we can also send electrical signals to these brain cells. And this is the way that we uh, managed to teach these brain cells how to play a video game. We take the chip, we put some cells on, and we connect it to a computer. And by connecting it to a computer, we're able to read the electrical activity of these brain cells. And we take that activity and we have them control the paddle to go up or down in the classic video game Pong. But not only are they controlling the paddle going up and down, we also send an electrical signal back to the cells, telling them where the position of the bouncing ball is so that they can move the paddle to hit the ball. And every time, the cells move the paddle to hit the ball, we give it a positive signal, and every time it misses, we give it a negative signal. And what's fascinating is that by doing this, the cells learn how to play the game without a body on a computer chip within five minutes. Now, you may be thinking, isn't it a little bit simple a task, maybe perhaps even trivial, to get brain cells on a computer chip uh, to play a video game? And the answer is yes, but there is a very interesting thing that we had learned, and that is the cells use far less energy and data in comparison to a traditional computer when asked to do the same task. Now, this is partly the reason why the robots that we all want are still stuck in factories and warehouses. We need to rethink our approach to computation, to intelligence, if we want to see these robots walk amongst us. So now you're probably thinking, where do these brain cells come from? 
Well, we grow these brain cells out of skin, blood, and really any cell that actually has a nucleus. We do this using stem cells. And stem cells are a very special type of cell. And we were all born with them. That's how we all got started. Um, that can, they can turn into any type of cell in the body. About a decade ago, a Japanese researcher by the name of Professor Yamakana won the Nobel Prize in medicine when he discovered that if you took any adult cell, skin cell, blood cell, um, cheek cells, and you mix it together in a cocktail of four different compounds, you could turn back the biomolecular clock of these cells and make them into stem cells. And we do this in my laboratory. We take these cells, these adult cells, and turn them into stem cells, and then we make them into brain cells that go into the chip. Now, what's incredible about these brain cells is that they are genetically the same as the brain cells from the donor in their heads. And we are able to do this without even cracking open the skull. Imagine the future. We will be able, we will be able to um, know for certain uh, which medications we're able to give you that will have an effect without the mental side effects, because we'll be able to take your blood and turn them into stem cells, put them on a chip, and test the drugs that we would give you, but instead of giving it to you, we would be giving it to the chip to understand on a personal level what the effects of the medications would be and if there are any mental side effects. This future is soon approaching. Now, with any new technology, there are always ethical questions that emerge. Take, for instance, generative AI. It's probably the hottest thing right now. There are questions of who owns the content that gets generated from such systems. Uh, similarly, with this kind of technology, there are questions that arise when we think about a computer driven by cells that control robots that make work for us, or a computer with someone's cells uh, being used to discover new medications. Who owns or is responsible for these outcomes? This is a space that we've never uh, come across, and it's only possible because of the development of this new technology. Additionally, René Descartes, the famous French philosopher, once said, I think, therefore I am. These chips think. <laughs> and so we need to start understanding what consciousness is. Now, the system that we've built has the complexity of something equivalent to a bee. And I'm pretty certain that most of us here would agree that a bee is not conscious. However, as with every technology, as time progresses and we understand how to improve this, we will start building larger, more complex systems. And unless we understand what consciousness is, it's going to be very hard for us to know where to draw the pink and the red lines for such a technology. This is a space that my team and I are actively researching in, and we work with some of the best bioethicists around the world to come up with a consensus, to understand and to agree upon um, these uh, parameters. But I also encourage you, as members of the community, because ethics is a two-way street, to think about the implications of such a technology and also what goes beyond the horizon. And with that, thank you very much for coming to listen to my TED Talk.